The Congress this year, as you know, is sponsored by the Business Ethics Center at Kaminsky University under the leadership of Wojciech Gasparski. This center has been and will continue to be uh, one of the intellectual leaders on the international thinking about business ethics in our changing economy. The center was a very early organization to think globally and systemically about ethical issues in commerce, and those of us in the international business community have always looked to the center and Professor Gasparsky for insights into this topic. My challenge to you is as academics and as practitioners, are we prepared for these economic shifts? Are we prepared to work in these emerging markets? Or are we just going to continue to teach business as usual and the worn out MBI, MBA curricula? It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the Congress National Committee and the Business Ethics Center a joint unit of Kozminski University and the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences. Your response to the invitation is outstanding. 320 participants from 43 countries of all continents registered. 163 contributions accepted out of 223 submitted. They will be presented during 10 parallel tracks of four sessions each. Eminent scholars and practitioners accepted our invitation to present keynotes during five plenary sessions devoted to carefully selected topics and to organize 18 interactive panel discussions on issues crucial now and for the days to come with 103 contributors. All of the Congress activities are focused on its general idea, tradition and new horizons towards the virtue of responsibility. Among all the people speaking to you this morning, I'm, I'm the lucky one because I have the easiest job to do. My job is to introduce to you someone who doesn't need introduction. Uh, and this is founder of Solidarity, Nobel Prize winner, former president of Poland, President Lech Wałęsa. Wydawało mi się, że zostanę ostatnim rewolucjonistą. I thought I would be the, the, the last revolutionary. Ale pa, kiedy patrzę na obecny świat i jego problemy, dochodzę do wniosku, że zmienią mnie następni rewolucjoniści. But when I observe today's world and its problems, I think that I will be actually replaced by other new revolutionaries. Problemy, które stanęły przed nami, trudno będzie bez rewolucji rozwiązać. It will be very difficult to actually solve problems which we challenge today. Traditions, new horizons. We've been in a very reflective time within the academy in the last few days. Last week we were in Lausanne celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the creation of academy and I think self-critically wondering what has been achieved, what has, pro what has progress been defined as, what kind of impact has been made, and also where did we come from and how close we are to realizing our founding mission. Last but not least, what are some of the conditions to achieve structural and or systems change in pursuit of sustainable value creation and positive externalities? If we look at the, if we analyze the global surveys uh, that go on what's going on in our societies, it reveals that throughout the world today people have less trust than ever. This is so with regard to governments' abilities to effectively manage economic, social and environmental problems. It is with regard to the trustworthiness of the media. Even Christian churches, traditionally sources of moral orientation and normative guidance, are suffering from a long-term trend of decline in trust. Business is also suffering from a pronounced low level of trust. 
the Edelmann Trust Barometer 2012 finds on average less than 50% of the population trusting that business is doing the right thing, that is, that corporations are working in the best interest of society. All those methods to, to, to manage the companies uh, in the Taylorian, Taylorian way uh, well, appear to, to not be sufficient in the difficult times. We cannot predict not only the, the, the next year, but the next day. And the only thing on which we can base the management of the hundreds or thousands of peoples, people we have in our company, it's about values today and, and ethics. We, we, we are becoming, because of this unknown, fuzzy, blurry world, uh, the only thing we can, uh, we can today somehow use to manage our teams it's, is the trust. I should tell you that the session is not so much on Global Compact, but a critique of Global Compact. Both Donald and I have been living and working on and with UN Global Compact since its inception. And after 12 years of pursuance, we have more or less agreed that Global Compact is at best a rationalization of rituals rather than an expression of performance. Okay, there's an increasing use of these multi-stakeholder voluntary codes of conduct, and the Global Compact is one of, one of many. The OECD has its guidelines. There's others like the Equator Principles, the Forest Stewardship Council, the Marine Stewardship Council. And in one way or another, these are all attempts to govern in either industry or across industries, the conduct of some set of global businesses. There are about uh, 47,000 multinational corporations, plus uh, there are 300,000 uh, subsidies operate in the global uh, uh, economy. And uh, uh, I found this number, 3,000, is pretty low, with compared to the number of the large corporations, and so on and so forth. But, uh, of course, uh, uh, you can come to a conclusion that the corporate world seems to almost entirely neglect the UN Global Compact. What are our first experiences after those uh, three uh, reports we published? Uh, what are the difficulties? Because it's the, the, the most important what, what is to, to improve. The first one is lack of commonly accepted standards of integrated reporting, and that's why there is a necessity to develop our own rules based on available reporting methods and experiences of leaders in integrated reporting. As I said, we were the first company in Poland, so it was quite difficult. We had to uh, look for the best uh, experiences uh, in Europe, in other companies from the region. The necessity to introduce profound changes in data, aggregation system in place, it's always difficult to, to show the progress, as you said. Uh, initiating cooperation with a large number of stakeholder groups within the Rotos group, around 40 specialists represented different areas, different companies. We, uh, besides the Glotos group, there are 15 uh, subsidiaries, and uh, it's a very difficult process to, to find the solution to plan together the the process to put it together and to to to, to run this 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 project and the last one is a shortage of knowledge of the benefits of integrated reporting among the stakeholders connected with the polish capital market and i think that this is the um, let's say the job for us also how to show those benefits and uh, what uh, can it bring uh, better ideas for our shareholders The more ethics management, the less ethics in management. And the challenging question of our debate was how to overcome this management paradox. I personally was convinced that the, a more spiritual approach to business ethics, strengthening intrinsic motivation, was needed. But Hank van Leyt did not agree with my conclusion. And I quote here his statement. 
Ethics in business is too serious a matter to make it dependent on the morality and spirituality of individuals. I think I will try to give you um, a guideline for being active in financing for ethical behavior by analyzing two issues. The first issue is, do ethics in finance basically correspond with legal compliance? Mm. And the second one is, it is true to state that action which is taken in legal compliance is always ethical. Let's start with the first question. I think most of the cases currently being discussed would be no cases if the people involved would have complied with the legal rules. Business activity needs to have uh, strong values and uh, people who don't have those values, whether they are in banking or not, I think the, the issue is really uh, just uh, the same. The easiest answer would be to say that because we ignore ethical aspects of the finance, it leads to a reckless behavior of the market participants. And actually, we could point out that the ethical perspective has a very long tradition and of economics as a discipline derived from uh, philosophy. So we could invoke Adam Smith and all the uh, people that uh, followed after. However, very recently we took a more narrow and technical view of finance, which Amartya Sen in his essays on economics and ethics called engineering view. And it uh, takes its roots in the neoclassical school of, of, of economics. Because of the Minsk and organizer that they invited me as a representative, a representative of Polish banks, I thought the, in, after uh, such scandals which happened uh, in the world, the banks will be ex excluded from such events like uh, today's <laughs> conference and we will get only the uh, 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 final conclusions to implement. I'm very pleased to, to chair this session on ethical leadership and we have a, a super perspective. Um, in many of the discussions so far, there's been comment on what about the role of the business school in all this talk about uh, business ethics. And today, this morning, we have the opportunity to explore that in a little bit more detail. We are told that we, we contributed uh, to, to the crisis, etc., etc. Uh, it's true that the, the dominant logic is still today the shareholder value, even though, I mean, we don't like it. Uh, this is one of the real of today. Uh, um, I wouldn't be so strong vis-a-vis -vis business schools. I think there are plenty of other institutions that made more mistakes and the political class being number one because I think it's a governance problem that we faced um, uh, first of all. But it's true that uh, the role of business school has been uh, challenged. Uh, I think that one of the responsibilities of a dean is to be sure that the graduates of the program not only are trained in the disciplines of the program, but that those disciplines are also related to, or, or in, uh, I wouldn't say related, that ethics becomes an important part of the discussions. And that is not an easy assignment for any dean, because there is a body of people who are strongly in favor of ethics education, and there are faculty who are resistant, feeling that that is a discipline that belongs in the liberal arts or in philosophy, or but not to be a feature as the business school. Well, obviously, we were going to have an ethics course. And the ethics course, and here's where I think in business curriculums, ethics courses are not only important, but they need to be positioned correctly. In our curriculum, the ethics course is the capstone course. And we did this at Wharton because there was a debate about whether you put ethics at the beginning of an MBA program or at the end of it. But in an ethics course, you can basically talk about all the subjects in a business program, and you can pull them together because the ethics course is what pulls them together. Uh, we also looked at leadership and said, OK, when you study leadership, there are two parameters in which people study leadership. First comes from the notion of traits. What do people have to know? What kinds of skills do they need for leadership? Business schools tend to be pretty good at, with accounting and all of these things at developing those things. The second thing, though, that I think is, is deeply missing, and here I'll get to the other parts of your survey, is um, they not only need to have a certain set of skills, and yes, they need to have ethics, and yes, they need to have critical thinking, but they need something that, that is, is 
even more important, they need perspective. And the second way in which leadership is studied, if we were to draw an axis, would be by looking at context, traits and context. The world is facing, we heard in these couple of days, uh, serious uh, uh, problems. And in order to resolve these problems, including these paradoxes, uh, I think there are three fundamental dilemmas to be addressed. The first dilemma is the dilemma of uh, growth, how much materialism versus how much quality of life. <laughs> the other one is the uh, dilemma of um, power, how much control versus how much freedom. And the third one, the dilemma of interest, how much self versus how much community. I personally believe that in all three of them, we are moving toward one extreme, and we should find a more balanced position. There is no answer where this position uh, should be, but that is the role of leadership, to find an equilibrium or something that is uh, not only acceptable, but also promising uh, for the future. We have spoken these days in this conference a lot on business education, about ethics in teaching, ethics, business ethics in training, what kind of research topics. And the precondition for that, or one element to do it, is to see the status of this in a global level. And one of the motivations was to show that much more is happening in different parts of the world than we normally recognize. So to highlight the other continents outside Europe and the US, that was one of the main goals, to show that there is a lot more happening than we think. We decided in 2009, when I was uh, spending a year at globeethics.net in Geneva, to follow it up with a global survey. Global in the sense that we had the intention of, cover, of covering every country on the globe within the survey. And what we wanted to achieve was to provide a global and comparative view of economic and business ethics as field of teaching, training, and research with regard to the six areas that you can see there. First of all, what is the dominant terminology that is being used? Secondly, how widely, how prevalent is business ethics around the world? And finally, we also ask, we wanted to find out what are the major business ethical issues that business ethicists around the world foresee to emerge within the next five years. So that was the research agenda. Business ethics can be found in all corporate countries. There is teaching, training, and research in this field, but normally, in general, relatively low. Mostly developed in Brazil. It seems that Brazil is the country that has worked more and more deeper in this field, followed by Argentina, Chile, my own country, and Peru. Teaching and research is done mainly in universities and specifically in business school. It's different the situation in training because uh, they are scattered between business schools, ONGs, and consultants. I think the most important point is to teach them what a situation will look like when a major decision has to be made, be it environmental issues, be it a combination of having to downsize a company or shut down a company or uh, replace uh, uh, indigenous people because you wanted to start mining there. These are the issues that are really of interest and they don't have to be that contextual because these are the issues that the people can relate to and I think they are the most useful ones to teach decision making. They've got to position themselves into the role of the decision maker to really feel 
And I mean, feeling is really important to me to get the emotion, what it feels like to be the one who makes a decision. Always is very important to keep in mind is because as we see uh, business ethics scandals evolving, we see again and again something that I call the systemic core where something is wrong, where some systemic things have to be changed in order so that individuals can make better decisions. It's not always the individuals alone who should be uh, penalized, but it's sometimes the, the systemic, the systems they are part of. I feel confused about uh, the, the topic. How to educate people to uh, make a, moral, a better moral decision? Uh, when uh, when Cecilia asked me to participate in this panel, and uh, she said that uh, this is an informal, just uh, informal talk, then I feel very interested in this, uh, this topic because this topic is confusing me, you know. Like uh, uh, how to educate, who, uh, who are the educators of the, uh, the, uh, the, the moral um, decision? Moral, um, decision? I think there has been a lot of massive changes recently which we sometimes conceptualize in terms of our own careers to be or our careers that have been. And um, I took this question slightly differently, and we've all taken it slightly differently, mm -hmm. and that's part of the purpose of this, obviously. Um, my first degree was in philosophy, and you know, there wasn't much work in philosophy, so um, I thought I'd better become a teacher in uh, English and drama. And um, I, that sort of shaped a lot of my thinking, that I... I find it very difficult to see the possibility that business decisions or general decisions in life um, aren't um, very often underpinned with issues of morals and values. Um, that, that dimension is always there, or at least a judgment about that dimension is always there. The social crisis does continue. It is to be seen through the prism of large range, I would say. It's not the margin of social exclusion, growing inequality, driving very many people here and there into poverty and other misery, and growing social dissatisfaction. This gala is a good opportunity to express our gratitude to colleagues and friends, many of them were our masters and still are, that is, to the persons and organizations we are indebted to them for delivering the model to follow, encouragement, and their support. The symbol of Warsaw is a lady, mermaid. She is not visible it's very difficult to contact her personally. <laughs> but I was way able to meet her once before, during the process of preparation of this gala dinner. And I asked her whether she would like to be exposed. Oh, I am a lady. I pro pro prefer not. I prefer to be taken by the participants of the conference, of the Congress, in their hearts. Please answer my question. Do you feel her presence in your hearts? <laughs>